Would you welcome Brother Huntley to come preach the word? And everybody shouted, Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Thank you, Brother Williams, for refocusing our vision and helping us to get a far away look. It certainly helps every once in a while just to look way out there and to see what good things are ahead for every child of God. I stand here tonight overwhelmed by the presence of the Lord and the power of the Spirit and the potential of the Apostolic Pentecostal Church. Unlimited. If you would indulge me a moment, just let me say thank you to all of those of you that prayed for me during a totally shocking, startling, surprising, what I term health event. It was a health event. It ruined my testimony in this sense. I used to always enjoy testifying to doctors when I went for physicals that I'd never been in the hospital in my life. They messed me up. I had to stay a few days. Messed me up bad. The worst part of it all is I only attended because of the times in my pajamas. It's better in a suit. And I want to tell you, I watched all of the services, and I want to thank you for your prayers. I am especially blessed to stand here tonight by the mercies of God, the grace of God. And I am overwhelmed by the love of this organization. The kindness, the cards, the calls, it was humbling, humbling to see so many of you take time to call or to let me know that you were praying for me. And I give thanks. I appreciate my son-in-law being here on the front row here tonight. My son, Pastor Raleigh's First United Pentecostal Church, the driver that took me to the hospital, and the nurse said, whoever brought you here saved your life. I thank you, Brian, for being there with me. You know, it's a crazy time to die when you're trying to bury somebody else. You, you need to let everybody have their day, you know. Don't barge in here. Let everybody have their own time. Don't try to double up here. But I, I thank God for His kindness. And when you... Walk through these doors after situations like that. It has a whole different meaning. and It all looks different. And just to be able to stand here and see you and, and to be able to preach tonight. I had no fears except would I be able to preach. Is this it? That was my only concern. I didn't want to. I, I, my wife was trying to slow me down and on. After I was rehabilitating a little bit, she was trying to get me to do this, do that, and the other. I said, you are trying to get me to quit, and I'm not. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Right. But she wasn't. She was trying to keep me alive. Yeah. And, and she's a great reason that I am alive tonight, uh -huh. and I commend her. Enough of that. Thank you for this invitation to be here tonight. And I feel... Uh, privilege to stand. What preaching we have heard, every man of God, God is speaking to this body. And I appreciate it. First Samuel chapter number one. I do not come to you tonight with what I wanted to preach. I come to you with what I felt the Lord said I had to preach. And I'd whole lot rather do that than what I want to do. First Samuel chapter one, verse two. Thank you to the Pentecostals of Alexandria for all of their impeccable first-class hospitality, kindness. It's marvelous, isn't it? We rejoice in their kindness. The first book of Samuel, chapter 1, verse 2. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Panina. And Panina had children, but Hannah had no children. 
And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion. For he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provert, provoked her sore for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? And the source of my message tonight is the next question. Am not I better to thee? than ten sons? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? I preach to you tonight. There is no substitute for sons. There is no substitute for sons. Would you repeat that after me? There is no substitute for sons. Just a little bit louder now. Clap your hands and thank God for His goodness and mercy to us. And everybody shouted, Amen. Amen. God bless you, and you seem to know what to do. <laughs> I would like for you to note with me the scriptural profile of Hannah. The description we draw right out of the Word of God of Hannah. The Bible used terms like this. It said she wept. It said she wept sore. It said she would not eat. It said she was grieved in her heart. It said she was in bitterness of soul. The Bible said she prayed unto the Lord. She was provoked of her adversary. I pause to say I believe what that really means is she was made fun of. She was ridiculed. The Bible said she was of a sorrowful spirit. The scripture said she was misunderstood and she was also marked by the ministry. One understanding of that is that the man of God literally slapped her face. She was marked by the ministry. The scripture said she was afflicted. The scripture said she was a woman of complaint. The scripture said she was desperate enough that she treaded unto the uncertain arena that is greatly warned of in the scripture in so much that she made a vow to God. And every bit of that was rooted in the fact 
that she was barren. She was barren. To Hannah, maternity exceeded marriage. What I'm preaching is, just being saved is not enough. We must have sons. We must have sons because there is no substitute for sons. I believe what the Holy Ghost is doing in this meeting, if you will listen to the ministry and put your ear to the pulpit and to the voice of the Spirit, there is a definite refocusing and redefining of the purpose of the church in this moment of time. Hear me as I redefine the church for you just a moment. People dance here, but this is not a dance hall. And I know there's some folks that don't feel like they've had church if they don't get their dance. And we need our dance. But this is not a dance hall. People fellowship here. But this is not a fellowship hall. Well, he didn't even shake my hand. This is not a fellowship hall. People sing and they play music here. But this is not a platform for Nashville rejects. This is not a platform for the demonstration of human ability to make a living without taxation. People are entertained and find recreation here. But this is not a recreation center. This is a recreation center. The ship of Zion needs to drop anchor one more time at the original port of purpose of the New Testament church. And that is, it is a soul-saving station. The church is a soul-saving station. Clap your hands and shout hallelujah. In the Old Testament, barrenness was considered a reproach. I declare to this apostolic church tonight that spiritual barrenness is a reproach. It is a reproach. Empty parking lots are a reproach. Empty pews are a reproach. Empty altars are a reproach. Empty baptistries are a reproach. And it ought to be something we cry over and something we complain about and something we're grieved about and something we will vow about. Barrenness disturbed Hannah. Barrenness disturbed Rachel. For she said, give me children or else I die. The only hope of life for this apostolic church is spiritual children. Without new converts, we are destined to die. Without new converts, enthusiasm dies. Faith dies. Praise dies. Evangelism dies. The only way we're going to live is to have some. And if we don't have new converts, 
We're going to be destined to professional, robotical, traditional Pentecostalism. If there's anything I oppose, it's traditional, professional, robotical Pentecostalism. Elkanah represents a voice that is speaking subtly, strategically, and subversively to the apostolic church in this hour. This is what I sense is happening in this movement right now. Elkanah tried to appease Hannah's displeasure. Elkanah tried to defer her disturbance. And the way he did it was by saying, just be satisfied with gifts. Just be satisfied with portions. Accept your sterility and give up on your novel dream of having sons. But we're going to rise to our feet tonight to shout. There is no substitute for science. Since God, the Bible said had shut up her womb. Only God can open that womb. There's not a program that will open the womb of your church. There's no fleshly scheming that will open the womb of your church. Because when God shuts it, only God can open it. And when God opens it, Nobody's going to shut it. The New Testament opens with two angelic annunciations. Forecasting, predicting, and prophesying. Two supernatural births. Two sons would be supernaturally born. Jesus and John would be supernaturally brought forth. One of those boys would be born of Mary. The other of Elizabeth. Mary is the virgin. Elizabeth is the old married lady but has never been able to conceive. She's been exposed, but never conceived. And the angel said, not one woman is going to have a baby, but two are. One's going to be a virgin. The other's going to be an old lady that hadn't been able to conceive. Mary represents the foreign fields where the virgin gospel has not yet entered. She's the whole missionary front where the preacher hadn't got there yet. But she's going to have a son. We're going to have revival where there's never been revival. Elizabeth represents what we in North America probably are more confronted with. Elizabeth represents the old barren, elderly, 
exposed, but never had conceived. Elizabeth represents the churches that have never had revival. But the angel said, not just Mary, but Elizabeth is going to have a son too. I've come to tell you, Folks are going to be saved in churches that hasn't seen people saved. Altars are going to be lined. Baptismal tanks are going to be full. Parking lots are going to be overflowing because there is no substitute for sons. El Cana exposed his ignorance of women. The fact that he was clueless when it comes to women. When he said, am not I better to thee than ten sons. There's a reason my wife is not here tonight. She's at home with the grandbabies. So brother and sister Ballestero could be here tonight. I love you. I'll be praying for you. But I'm going to stay with the babies. You might as well wake up and realize, Elkanah, there is no substitute for sons. I'm going to make a statement when I do you shout no substitute ready no thank God for cathedrals no thank God for crowds no thank God for collateral no there is absolutely no substitute for sons being born at the apostolic altar and until that happens, nothing ought to make you happy. And until that happens, nothing ought to make you eat. And until that happens, nothing ought to make you smile. And until that happens, nothing ought to appease you. We are in an hour of the onslaught of substitutes, symbolism for substance, fables for truth, cheap for the expensive, convenient for the commandment, and the imitation for the original. But this is what the Holy Ghost has been talking to me about. Here's the substitute that is vying for acceptance in the apostolic church. And that is that the church be substituted from a mother to a babysitter. From a mother to a babysitter. A babysitter knows only how to provide, entertain, and preserve somebody else's babies. Somebody else's children. She knows nothing about labor. She knows nothing about pain. She knows nothing about delivery. And the devil's trying to turn this apostolic church into a babysitter instead of a mother. I rise.
to shout. There is no substitute for shout. Now hear this part very carefully because this is what I'm concerned about. I fear the model of ministry outside the apostolic church and the pseudo-icons of congregations of massive proportions of perverting the philosophy and the concept of church growth in some of our younger ministers and pastors. I'm not calling any names. You know who they are. You drive around their buildings. You preach their sermons. You salivate over their crowds. But let me set the record straight tonight. Those places are not about reaching the devil possessed. They are not about delivering the addicted. They are not about liberating the sinners. They don't grow their churches out of bars and drug dens. Their crowds come from other congregations and other churches. They don't have converts. They've got proselyted people. And you kick yourself. And you wonder why we can't do that. Why we aren't that way. They're not even in the same business. We're digging the homeless out. We're putting marriages back together. We're getting liquor out of their hands. We're getting sin out of their hearts. And too many of you are saying, I want to be like them. Hear me when I tell you they're not mothers, they're babysitters. Our only true growth comes out of our altars. Repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. not become content to babysit the floating church of every region. To babysit the move-ins. Everybody's got some. The move-ins. The transfers. Or the church hoppers. But hear me when I preach to you tonight. It's not about the transferred. It's about the transformed. Don't shout over a move in like you do somebody that's moved out of sin. places where they boasted great revival great move of God phenomenal increase and it had been better if I'd have had blinders on because when I surveyed the audience I couldn't see anybody that looked like a new convert.
If you're having revival, there's going to be some makeup there. There's going to be some earrings there. There's going to be some ladies with cut hair. There's going to be some shitter looking people. And if that's not the way your church looks, you're a babysitter and not a mother. Substitute for sons. There's nothing God can give me to get me off of my knees. I want sons. I want daughters. I want babies. be guilty of using our superior personalities superior giftings superior skills to entice other Christians I'm talking about real Christians I'm talking about apostolic Christians but let's use our personalities our gifts and our skills to reach the lost. It's amazing to me how comfortable some preachers are around other people's saints and very uncomfortable around sinners. We must not celebrate our increase by a brother's demise and call that revival. And if that's your case, you're not growing, you're swelling. Because when somebody builds a bigger building than yours and gets a little more fire than you got and has got a better choir than you got, your swelling's going to go down. But your sons and your daughters will not leave you no matter what's going on anywhere. must not come from someone else's subtraction. But I'm afraid of some elements in our movement are being impressed that you've got to have a big church. There's a difference in a big church and a growing church. I'm not interested in a big church. I'm interested in a growing church. And if our converts become so many, we've got to build another building, let's build it. But not off a bunch of move-ins that have been proselyted from somebody else. Set your schedule to pray on your brother. Oh, 
And don't set your standards to prey on your brother. Shame on you if you fill your churches with somebody else's compromisers. I don't care if you put on your marquee. This month's special. Tie 7%. you designing your church for? Who's your program for? What's this all about? It's to bring a beer guzzler in. It's to bring the prostitute in. It's to bring the liar in. It's to bring the murderer in. Not somebody else's saints. Notice this. Psalm chapter 87, verses 5 and 6. And of Zion, it shall be said, This and that man was born in her, and the highest himself shall establish her. The Lord shall count when he rideth up the people that this man was born there. When God counts, he only counts the ones that were born there. Let's have revival with sons and daughters. There is no substitute. So since the Bible said God would only count those that were born there, If God only counts those that are born there, how large is my church? If God only counts the ones that were born there, then really how large is my church? You want to know what kind of church you got? Go home next Sunday and say, if you came to the Lord here, if you obeyed Acts 2.38 here, stand up. Are you mad enough to do that? You'll find out if you're having revival or not if there's more move-ins and transfers than there are those that were born there. Tom Foster told me he was going home the other day early from this meeting. I said, Todd, I need you. Because <laughs> ain't nobody helps a preacher like Brother Tom Foster. I said, I need you. Stay here and help me. You see him on his feet here. Because he hasn't built a church with a vacuum cleaner. And just because you're smarter than somebody else doesn't mean you deserve their saints. And just because you got a better program doesn't mean you deserve their saints. You might have a bigger house with a swimming pool, but my babies ain't going home with you. And if you want to build a church, count those that are born there. Count those that are born there. There is no substitute 
for sons. I'd like for every pastor to push your way out of that chair and shout that right now. If I've got a hundred more next Sunday than I had last Sunday, but I didn't pray them through and I didn't baptize them, I'm going to keep on crying and I'm going to keep on complaining and I'm going to be grieved in my spirit until I get my own son. The devil is doing his best to substitute this church. Brother Libby, can I use you for an illustration? Might as well. I've preached it all over the country. I might as well use you. I appreciate that permission. What a willing soul. I'm going to brag on you. I wouldn't embarrass you. This guy comes from way out somewhere to the East Coast where Brother Libby has been laboring. How many years have you been there? 32 years! Yes, sir. Praying, fasting, discouraged, encouraged, excited, depressed. Roller coaster. Greatest church in the world. Bunch of devils and dingbats. <laughs> 32 years. This preacher calls him and says, I wonder, Brother Libby, could you spare Saturday with me? He said, I'm interested in coming into your area and starting a church. Would you have time to show me some of the Diverse areas around your city. Brother Libby, a kingdom minded man. <laughs> Brother Man's gonna kingdom minded man. <laughs> Say, God told Abraham to look. So Brother Libby spends the whole day with him. They go north, they go south, they go east, they go west. Sun's beginning to set on the day of interview. And they're having a meal together. And they're, as they eat, the guy says, Well, Brother Libby, let's just bottom line this today. He said, I want to know, if I come into your area, how many souls... Can I count on you giving me? <laughs> That's Elkanah. He's clueless. I love what Brother Libby said. Brother Libby leaned across the table in his own unique way with extreme tact and diplomacy and said, Brother, how big of a zero can you draw? <laughs> if you're going to build a church, don't go next door to a big church. Go somewhere where people are not being reached. Go somewhere where there's not a lighthouse. I hasten on. Everybody shout, there is no substitute for signs. Miracles, signs, and wonders must not be a substitute for signs. The best I know, God doesn't count healing. Uh -uh. I didn't say they didn't matter. I didn't say they weren't wonderful. I just stay in the book and said God only counted what was born. 
I'm afraid there's a deceptive spirit that wants us to go to Shoney's after church and brag about how many got healed. We don't need to get all wrapped up in telling pregnant women whether they're carrying a boy or a girl. Nine months, they'll know. We don't need anybody reading social security numbers. At the fair, they tell me they can guess people's weight and age. The, now, I know you're getting quiet on me because you can preach anything but so when you get folks excited. I told Brother Baker, you say miracles, angels, and they go nuts. You talk about souls and... I'm not against that, but I'm telling you, they're not to be a substitute. The greatest miracle is salvation. The greatest opening of blinded eyes is when somebody shouts, I see Jesus is God. I see Jesus is God. I see Jesus is God. Devil chasing. I was telling my wife what I was going to preach. And she said, I said, I don't know why I got this job. She said, I do. She said, you're the only one crazy enough to say it. <laughs> Too many of our churches are opening up spiritual karate classes. Taekwondo, Wando, whatever it is. Talking in tongues. Coming to church in fatigues. Teaching how to chop the devil. God doesn't count how many devils were cast out. He counts how many repent and how many get baptized in Jesus' name and how many get the Holy Ghost. The only time I'm going to fight the devil, Hallelujah. my soul, the devil, the only time I'm going to fight the devil is when he gets between me and somebody, I'm trying to reach for God. I don't care about being a professional devil to fear. Devil chasing, spiritual warfare is no substitute for sons. is no substitute for sons. God forbid that I should ever belittle, minimize, or make fun of somebody's walk with God. And if you don't like how holy they are, just be quiet about it. Leave them alone. That's between them and their God. Don't use a pulpit apostolics to make fun of standards and holiness and separation from the world. But my estimation is this. We spend way too much time washing nets And not enough time fishing. God 
does not compliment clean nets. God does not celebrate clean nets. Fish is his wish. And he wants it smelling like fish, looking like fish, sounding like fish. Our churches ought to be fishy. Something fishy about this church. In the parable of the talents, the man commended was the one that gained five. But the secret of his success was that while he gained five, he did not lose the five he was originally given. He didn't trade the old five for a new five. He was only commended because he got five new ones but kept the five old ones. If growth causes us to lose what we were originally given, it is not true growth. I said that heart attacks helped him. <laughs> you know why it helped me? I ain't got nothing to lose. I ain't trying out. I ain't hoping for something else out of this. I don't have any ulterior motive. But just to say, this is what God said. This is what God said. Second Samuel chapter 18 and verse 18, a unique verse of scripture. Now Absalom in his lifetime had taken and reared up for himself a pillar which is in the king's dale. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. And he called the pillar after his own name. And is called unto this day Absalom's place. Since Absalom had no sons, he built statues. Since Absalom left no people, he built pillars. Since Absalom left no men, he built monuments. Look. I ask you tonight, how will you be remembered? Statues or sons? Pillars or people? Monuments or men?
because he had no sons, he built statues to be remembered. You will be forgotten if you're not a soul winner. There is no substitute for sons. Don't let your gifts and your portions satisfy your empty altars and your empty baptistries. And you leave bragging about the increase of the tithe. Or the talent that is now on your pews instead of sons there is no substitute for sons would you bow your heads feel like the Holy Ghost would like to root somebody out of these seats on their feet saying thank you for the gifts but I gotta have sons thank you for your kindness but I gotta have sons thank you for the portions but I gotta have sons thank you for the blessings but I gotta have sons Thank you for the numerical increase, but I gotta have sons. Thank you for those that have come to help me, but I gotta have sons. And why? 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 I've got to have a son. Don't be satisfied with just good church. Don't be satisfied with just a lot of shouting. Don't be satisfied with just everybody feeling good when they go home. Don't be satisfied with everybody bragging about your sermon. Give me children. Or I'm going to die. Only sons will keep your church alive. There is no substitute for sons. Thank you for my cathedral. Thank you for the crowd. Thank you for the collateral. But I gotta have sons. Turn around to somebody and say, Pray for me. I gotta have sons. I refuse to be satisfied with move ins. I refuse to be satisfied with being in a good part of the country where everybody wants to move. I refuse of having a climate controlled church. I refuse to be satisfied with a strong financial environment to draw people to me. I've got to have sons. There is no substitute for sons.